Welcome to another episode of The Axis, unscripted, unbiased, and everything automotive. My name is Liv Vitale, and I'm joined today with Aaron Moore, Vice President of Sales at Axiom Connected, and our special guest, Don Brady, Vice President of Dealer Success at Ship Your Car Now, and President of Don Brady Consulting, Inc. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. So I think we can all agree times are a little weird right now. Um, we're in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that has affected every aspect of life, from businesses and jobs to home life to school life, uh, even society in general as we practice social distancing and living under stay-at-home orders. Um, I would also say that we could probably agree that the automotive industry is not getting through this pandemic unscathed. We know the automotive industry has been going through its own challenges before this as we were evolving to better serve the modern consumer. And the big topic of that change was digital and digital transformation. But now we have this new plot twist that's forcing the issue even faster than before. Um, so today, I would like to hear from you both on how we are currently being affected by COVID-19, how dealers are adjusting, and what you think maybe the new normal will be after this. So um, to lay a little groundwork, though, I think first, let's talk about the challenges dealers were facing pre-COVID. Um, so Don, let's go ahead and start with you on some of your thoughts on that. Well, I've been in the car business for 22 years. And my last two stints were as general manager. And I think prior to this, the funny thing was, it's exactly what we're now being, dealers are being forced into, and that is into the digital retailing. Um, dealers have been fighting it and all along. It's not all dealers, but a lot of dealers have been fighting it all along. And I was with uh, Montrose Auto Group, and I was actually using Autofy, and I was kind of going into the, the digital retailing side. And everybody was complaining about Carvana at that time, saying Carvana's, what they're doing is wrong and taking over the world. And, and really what needs to happen is dealers prior to this really needed to embrace digital retailing. And now they're, they're finding themselves where they're almost forced to embrace digital retailing. Absolutely. I think that, um, I think that's a, a very valid point of, we were kind of already working towards that digital transformation and it was like, oh, we've got some time, five years, 10 years down the road. And now it's like, just kidding, we kind of got to do it now. So um, why don't we then talk about a little bit, so what are, what's the current state of affairs with our dealers? What's, um, what are they kind of facing right now? Well, I've actually been talking, obviously talking to dealers every day. I've, I've, I've been forced into a, uh, Zoom meeting, Skype meeting, um, email, phone call conversations. Um, what I, I was one of the guys out there that I walked away from the retail side of the car business in January, and I started a business in March, early March of 2020, which is right at the start of our United States part of the pandemic. Um, so anybody that starts a business right now would probably be, they would probably be labeled as crazy, but that's where I'm at. So. Um, but talking with dealers again, they're now they're like reaching out for help. They they really want to have the digital retailing. They really need the um, the shipping piece, which is what Carvana obviously door to door service. Um, I just had a dealer reach out to me yesterday. They sold a truck to a customer in California, and they're in South Carolina. So now we're in the process of shipping that truck for them. Um, so at least now. They're embracing what really has been needing to happen. Um, and I, I foresee this not going away. Um, you know, half the customers or 30, 40 percent of the customers are going to want to buy this way, the Carvana way, the Vroom way. Um, so it now, you know, being forced into it. I, I remember when I got into the car industry, they were telling I had sales managers telling me that all oh, the Internet's just a a fad and a phase and it, it'll, it'll go away. Well, obviously that's not ever going to be the case and digital retailing. I look at it the same way. This is not going away. So um, sometimes getting forced into something isn't really that bad, you know, get you, get you going. It'll be interesting to see the, if there's any geogra geographic differences into how the dealerships respond. Don, I'm curious to see what you think, but like, you know, in Ohio where we are, dealerships are allowed to stay open they're considered essential business but the neighboring state of pennsylvania has completely locked down you know dealership sales services allowed to stay open and i've actually spoke with a dealership here locally that the interesting thing is um 
their penetration rate in terms of sales is much higher because if you're just going to kick some tires, you're not going to go out and look at a car, right? You're, you're, you're a serious buyer now. Um, so you go out and so they're, they're having a higher close rate. They're having a higher penetration with F and I because they're able to spend more time with the consumer and give them more, you know, sort of personalized touch. Um, so, you know, I'm curious, do you think geography will matter as to how the dealerships respond? Or do you think the industry as a whole will recognize that this is an issue? Well, I, I think the whole industry needs to embrace it because, Agreed. and I see what you're saying. And, and, uh, but I think the whole industry needs to, because buyers are going to be, are all over the United States. Carvana has kind of proven that, that people do buy sight unseen. They buy pre-owned vehicles. They haven't even crossed over into the new side, but the reality is um, we can sell new and pre-owned anywhere in the United States. Your customer base can be anywhere in the U.S. Um, and shipping isn't really that expensive when it comes down to it. I mean, sometimes customers will get on a plane, fly out to Illinois, pick up their car and drive it back. Um, but with with time constraints, now with shipping, they can actually get it right to their door. And that's what Carvana has actually shown that, wow, people will buy sight unseen and have a car delivered if the price is right and they feel comfortable. Um, I actually stepped it out of the um, consultant role and into the customer role, and I am in the process of purchasing a vehicle in Texas, and I did it all through email and phone, and and, uh, and it's going to be delivered to my house here in a few days. So, and it was interesting as a customer to take those steps and, and actually work with a dealer in another state, um, and it, it's been pretty pretty seamless. Don, are you, I don't know if you have the statistics or not, I don't, but I wonder, is there a percentage of cars that are sold across state and shipped like this? Do we know, is it 20% of sales or is it a bigger percentage? You know, I, I don't, I don't have those, those percentages and I, and I, I probably need to get those, but I think that it's going to be skewed now because of this pandemic. I think it's going to increase, especially with the states that are taking the stance that you can't. I mean, what's going on in PA is ridiculous. I mean, to tell them that they they can't sell a car online is insane. I I, I use the and I did a video this morning on LinkedIn, and I uh, I think it's insane that they'll allow 125 people to walk around a to walk around a. Um, I think that it's real important that they can walk around and buy groceries and touch everything, and yet they can't and out of the living room buy a car. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and it'll be interesting, like you said, to see the pre-COVID shipping rates and then post, right, to see how much of the consumer has changed um, their buying habits. Absolutely. I think that was a good point, though, kind of what Don was just saying of like, um, you know, it is an interesting thing. We're, we're saying groceries are essential, which obviously they are, and people need to go to the grocery store to get those things. But now we're now we're getting into some tricky areas of, you know, and we're even seeing some of the grocery stores are now saying, okay, only 10 people in the store at a time and all these things. So, um, you know, to your point, why can't we do some things similarly in the dealership world? Because, you know, and, I, and at first I was even kind of like, well, I mean, you know, people buying cars, like, do you really have to do it right this minute? But then I saw somebody posting, it's like, well, I just passed an accident of four total vehicles. Those people aren't going to have vehicles now. I'm like, oh, well, duh. Like, yeah, like people are still out there operating. They're still doing, you know, as much as they can to keep their lives moving within the parameters. And so well, there are still need to be cars sold and we are going to have to be, allow the ability to make those adjustments so that we can evolve in still service people's needs while obviously keeping the health of, of our society a, a main priority. Well, and if you think about it, you know, those vehicles are also delivering the food, right? They, those, you know, Uber Eats right. and everything that's going on right now, you know, that's essential. So if, I, if I'm a delivery person and my vehicle breaks down or is, you know, inoperable and I need to get back on the road, I might have to go buy one. And that's in order to serve the needs of the consumers for the, you know, their, their vital needs. So it, it may slow down because again, people might not just go kicking tires and think about buying one, but there's a need for vehicle sales. So, uh, you know, I, I personally believe it's an essential service along with servicing of existing vehicles. It has to keep people moving or else we're going to have some serious issues. Absolutely. Well, there's also 
there's also a, a, and I don't have the exact number, but it was when I did see it, it was staggering the amount of leases that are ending this month. They ended last month. They're ending this month. They're ending now. Some of the manufacturers uh, or the captives of them are extending the leases. But what about the miles? People are over their miles, and now they're extending the lease, but they're over the miles. It's going to get into a huge, um, um, just like traffic of all these customers, and what they're who's going to eat all this money? Is it going to be the the not the manufacturers, but is it going to be GM Financial? Is it going to be Ford Motor Credit, or is it going to be the customers? Um, everybody's worrying about, you know, all these things, but yeah, I, I mean, to Aaron's point, people get to move. They got, they got to go places. And I, I hadn't even thought about the lease side of it, Don. That's a great point. Yeah. You, you've got turn-ins and, you know, if, if I'm a consumer and, and I'm over my mileage by a month or two, I, I might've just got a break. Absolutely. So coming on the, 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 you know, obviously I, you know, as I'm looking at data, um, and we don't want to turn this into a a healthcare conversation, but, um, you know, I see the flattening of the curve going on, at least in Ohio. I, I know Don, you know, you've probably seen that as well. If you're tracking things, there is going to be the other side, right. And hopefully sooner rather than later. So how do you see just with your experience within dealerships and, and how they operate, how are dealers going to move forward? I mean, they, they're going to push towards digital and retail, but I'm just curious from from a, a personal perspective, do you see them looking for partners to step up to provide these platforms? Is it something that large dealership groups will create their own um, solutions? What do you see as the path forward for dealership groups? Well, and I, I've been talking to dealers and, I, and my, my advice to them has been literally sit down, take a deep breath, call in people that you trust. And, and talk about your next game plan and don't wait until, because what's going to happen is as soon as, and we all, this is going to be truth. As soon as our freedom is given back to us, because um, in a way it's taken away from us here in the last month. Um, but as soon as we are released from this, people are going to want to storm restaurants. They're going to want to storm dealers. They're going to, I mean, the, there's going to be a buying frenzy. Um, but at the same time, the government's going to tell us, that we can't go into this frenzy. Um, you know, we've got to, we've got to, we're going to have to change how we do, how we do things going forward. Um, obviously, our hands are going to be cleaner. There's going to be a lot of good things there, um, but at the same time, we have to think about those things. No, that's a that's an interesting point um, that you bring up. You know, I think we've seen some dealerships currently making adjustments, you know, real time and how to get through this immediate situation. Um, but I think that's also a very interesting point of like, okay, what are we going to do after work? Like, do we keep some of these things that we've done um, and then bring them into our, you know, process going forward? Or do we completely change the process? I don't know what, you know, what are you, what are some of your thoughts, Don, on, on what you envision and seeing kind of being the new normal? Well, there's even talk right now that there, there's advice, I should say, given to dealers that they should actually keep their prices high. And, and my, my advice has been the exact, exact opposite. I would, uh, you know, take any deal you can take. Don't necessarily lose money. But what's going to happen is these obviously the manufacturers have all but stopped building cars. So at, when, when we do finally get um, released, there's going to be a lesser amount of new car availability. Um, the pre-owned cars, obviously the leases will start getting turned in. Um, I would I would continue to, in that sense, online, if I were the, it was a GM of a store still, I would probably, and it's going to hard, be hard to say this, but I would do business as usual, you know, take every deal I can take, um, you know, be fair with my pricing, but but at the end of the day, move the metal and, and not be afraid that there won't be more metal to get after the pandemic is, is um, over, I, I would continue to sell cars. And there's some places that are literally like thinking they're just hold on to these cars. And, and I think they're still going to be depreciating. No, not much different than what they used to be. Yeah. That's an interesting approach too. I'm, I'm curious if, you know, new car pricing is new car pricing in a sense, right? I mean, there's MSRP and such. But with used cars, if there's going to be this 
you know, onslaught of demand, it, it, it almost kind of puts me in the mind of, you know, tax return time when the prices kind of go up on used cars. Are we going to see that in the latter half of the year, I wonder? Aaron, I think that's possible. And then right now, um, what pulled me into the market was exactly what everybody's hearing, 84 months, 0%, um, no payment for 60, 90, 120 days. Um, it made me start looking and ultimately I switched to a certified pre-owned um, that was, you know, 14,000 instead of 25,000. So, um, I mean, it's it's as crazy as it sounds, it's probably a pretty good time to buy a new car um, for, for the people in the United States. This would probably be a good time to buy a car, but I know not everybody's thinking about buying cars right now, um, but it, it pulled me as a consumer into looking. Um, I mean, 84 months at no interest, you can buy a twenty-one thousand dollar car, you know, and 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 be two fifty a month. I mean, it, those that's that's kind of unheard of. Yeah, absolutely. I've, yeah, like you said, I've seen quite a few manufacturers putting out different types of of programs, whether it be zero percent or you know the the delayed payments, you know, three months no payments, things of that nature. Um, you know, I wonder from just as your experience on the dealership side there too, as a GM, I'm thinking that from an F and I perspective, I'm thinking consumers are going to be changing what they're going to want to protect their car with, um, you know, things like gap insurance and unemployment insurance, things of that nature. Yeah. I mean, obviously if, if all of us could have seen into a crystal ball, we might've done things a little differently pre pandemic. Um, but you're right. I think, I mean, I, obviously I bought a warranty and gap insurance, um, you know, and I, and I, but I always have done that. I like to protect my, my, investment but yeah you're right i mean the i mean no one could have ever thought that this many people would be applying for unemployment in our country um and i i in fact in my talks i keep telling people um i, I don't want to personally live thinking that this is the way things are going to be forever i want to live for Okay, what's what am I going to do after this is over? Let, let's let's prepare for that, and that's why I think the salespeople that are out there that are laid off, if if it were me, I would be training and, and sharpening my tools. So when we do pull out of this pandemic, and we will, because Americans do that, um, they're going to be ready for that that onslaught of people that are coming in and wanting to um, buy cars at that point. Spoken like a true optimistic sales guy. <laughs> yes, yes, we, sir. All, we, we all know there's a there's a you know a bright side coming so that's uh so you know I, as we're talking about this and the transformation of the dealerships and how they're going to go digital um you know obviously carvana is the one that is spearheading this room to an extent kind of following suit with I, i'd love to get your perspective um you know we know how carvana is kind of doing it right but anything where you can think of where online sales right now is wrong. I mean, is there improvements that in your mind would be positive um, or things that aren't being thought of? Just, you know, thinking futuristically here, like if, if this was the Dawn show, right, and, and you were deciding how that process and workflow should be, what gaps are there right now and what should be what should be put in place? Okay, well, I, I can tell you, I, I'll start out by saying that Carvana, in my opinion, is not doing everything right. Um, in fact, if you read any article about Carvana that's on the downside, they, they talk about how they're losing money and they're losing a lot of money. Um, and obviously they don't have the ability to service the customers that they're selling. So I, I've been saying forever that the brick and mortar dealerships are still a much, much, much better choice for a consumer to purchase a car. Um, locally, they can service them after they sell the car. And nationally, if they sell certified pre-owned, for example, they can go to any Chevy store, any Ford store, um, anywhere in the country and get service work done. Um, so service is one part of it that I would say. Um, the, the dealerships that are have always been real nervous about getting into the digital retailing side, they automatically, it's it's the, the margins of, have gotten smaller and smaller profit margins. So obviously the only chance really in, in, in some people's mind for a dealership to make money is obviously in the finance department in reserve and in, 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 
and uh, selling warranties and gap insurance and credit life and disability and all the things that they sell. And they're thinking that if a customer buys from another state, they're most likely not going to buy an extended warranty or gap insurance. And there could be some truth of that. So I think they need to sharpen that tool um, and, and obviously set their prices at a fair markup, but at the same time, they need to get better at, at selling. And it's hard to sell virtually. It, you know, like, I mean, you can, it's customers do still out there want to touch and feel and smell, but then there's a lot of them that don't. So what I've been telling people is you still want to take care of your customers that are local and there's still going to be customers that are going to want to come in, kick the tires, drive the car and buy it. But at the same time, don't eliminate the customers that are okay with buying without touching and feeling and smelling. So it's it's there's a there's a line there. And, and why alienate 30, 40, 50 percent of the customers if you can you want to approach all 100 100 percent of the customers? So I think it needs to be a, a, a balance of both. Just thinking out loud, I'm curious if like a solution to for a Carvana from the servicing perspective is you know, linking up with a national chain, right, that could do the servicing and they become a Carvana service center. Yeah. And then, I mean, and I mean, all of us, we buy, if you buy a Chevy and you're, and you're traveling for vacation, if you're, if you're seven states away and your car breaks down, you don't think, oh no, I got to wait till I get back to Ohio. You're going to go to the local Chevy store. So, um, and, and it'll be interesting. There is still dealers out there, believe it or not. And I've had customers tell me this, that that they could not get service from a dealer because that dealer says, you know, if you didn't buy it from us, go to your dealer. I mean, that's very short sighted. And I think it's probably becoming more and more rare. Um, but but that still does happen out there. So um, I, I don't think they would ever turn away a Carvana customer. I would hope they wouldn't because it's a service, you know, that they can they can earn money in the service side. But um, that does still happen out there. Right. Well, and and actually, it's funny you said that. I've actually heard that, too. And I've been, you know, kind of pessimistic about whether it was true or not. But <laughs> apparently it does exist. Um, I've never experienced that myself. But I was just thinking, you know, like you said, Carv- again, I'm, we keep using Carvana just because they're they're out there. But I'm thinking any company like a Carvana or, or themselves if they were attached with a national service chain and directed people to that service chain and then were able to participate in service revenue, right? Um, that could be the difference between them actually, you know, operating in the black versus the red. It's a good idea, Aaron. And maybe you should contact Carvana and see if they can give you a percentage of it. Yeah. Can I patent that real quick? That's, yeah. yeah. There is a, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Not a bad that just, idea. That just came up on the top of my the tip of my head too. So nice. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I still think that the dealerships still have the ability to, to become a good digital retailer. Um, and it, and when you ask about gaps, I mean, it, it the salesperson needs to, um, customers buy people, even even in a digital retailing sense. So I, my my opinion is the salesperson should send a good personal video. Um, introducing themselves and 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 showing a good um, video of the car, answer all the customers' questions. It's real important. I mean, I used to tell my salespeople, when you get a lead, the first thing you have to do is read the entire lead because, um, and you've probably seen out there, there's there's memes of of a of a gravestone and a sales sales manager, and and it says um, that to the death of your customers that they need to come in before we answer their questions those those days are past um and and there's a lot of truth to the fact that that those days are over um you got to answer their questions because what happens in the past the the customer would literally ask a question has it been smoked in the vehicle been smoked in and the response from the salesperson was um can you come in at three o'clock or is a four o'clock better when, and, and the customers out there, they'll just move on. They'll move on to the next dealership. You're not going to answer my questions. I, I'm out. And they that push, I think, will will lessen now to where we actually need to listen to what the customers are wanting. Yeah, and I think this, you know, sales has definitely changed. I remember back in the day, um, you know, I don't want to date myself, but when I was coming out of college and I went to a dealership and, you know, all they wanted to do was sell me on payment. 
right? And, but they wouldn't give me a price on the vehicle. What payment do you want? So I literally have never gone back to that dealership due to that. But, I, you know, at this point, I think that it sales in a dealership is more of a consulting sales uh, role, right? It's it's guiding the customer and maybe sometimes making a recommendation that this isn't really the vehicle you want, right? Let me show you why. This might be the one that you would want to look at. You know, it's it's working with them um, to make sure that they make the right choice. Well, and I feel like too, you know, with what we're going through and and having to practice these social distancing, and I know even just from a family perspective, you know, none of my family lives in the same state, so we've been doing a lot of virtual happy hours. So it's like forcing us to use this technology that's been around. And I think to that same point is happening, Don, just like the example you were giving at a dealership level. Take the video of the car, introduce yourself, help the customer. You can still connect to the customer and help them feel confident from a distance. And and it's through that use of that technology and embracing it. And I think, you know, kind of Aaron, to your point, you can still do that, you know, consultative type selling with that of like, hey, here's kind of what you're originally looking at because you were wanting, you know, maybe X, Y, and Z feature, I've got another one you might, you might be a little more interested in and here's why. And let me show you a quick video of what this looks like. There's, there's absolutely a way be, to, 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 you know, adopt our processes to that as opposed to the old school way of, yeah, we'll just come in and let's, let's waste both of our time so that you can come in and look at this and then realize, oh, it has been smoked in. So you don't want the car. And now, now what, like, what was the point of that? So I think this will be right. interesting to help push people to it's really kind of that wake up call of like we've been preaching about this for a while now of like the need for digital the need for embracing and absolutely there's a point of having you know those hybrid ap approaches because there are consumers that still want to touch and look and feel um but if this isn't your wake up call to realize that you have to start embracing technology at some level in your dealership i'm not sure what is going to be the wake up call and one other thing I wanted to say too, the so I, I bought a certified pre-owned and, and felt good about the word certified pre-owned because um, obviously there's warranties that go along with that. Um, there's some interesting um, new things out there called certified healthy vehicle. Um, and, and this pandemic, when it ends, unfortunately, it's not going to completely end until they have a vaccine. Uh, and they're, I mean, I'm, I'm still hearing things that it could be a year or longer until that vaccine is available. So even if they do give us back some or all of our freedom, I'm, I'm personally going to, in fact, I saw that certified healthy vehicle and I actually sent the, the vehicle I'm buying, bought or buying, I sent them a message and said, Hey, I want to make sure you sanitize this thing before it gets on the, the carrier, come to my house. Um, so that is something else that's going to probably be out there. I mean, I, I think that people aren't going to stop worrying about catching this virus once once it's been released. So I know they're talking about making masks. I mean, my daughter was actually just sent me a picture of her and her friend that are now um, they're not they're not together. So they're they're doing a Zoom meeting between the two of them, and they're wearing masks for the Zoom meeting, which made me smile. But I think people seeing people in masks probably won't. And for us in, in the next month or two or six months, who knows? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they're talking about, you know, the second wave in the fall potentially. And, and I think that's, you know, to your point, you said earlier of like taking this time to really, you know, kind of circle the wagons and plan and really be strategic and thinking about the changes you want to make. Cause when you come out of this, you are going to have to make some changes um, for more of the short term as well as the long term. And, um, I definitely think it's interesting to see some of those companies pivots. I know, you know, in our, our marketing team, we obviously deal with a lot of printers and seeing printers shifting from making, you know, your traditional pop-up banners and stuff to now all of a sudden they're printing cloth masks. And we even see some of our OEMs pivoting. And now instead of making these vehicles, they're shifting to make ventilators. And um, I think that's a very interesting aspect to all this as well, to see kind of what people are doing to kind of get through this immediate phase. Um, you know, dealers, I saw one with um, helping sanitizing the police vehicles for their local community. So it's really cool to see those different aspects, but it's interesting to see what people are going to really start to do to plan for coming out of this on the other end. You know, and there's, there's companies that are, like you said, I mean, it's, you know, it's a capitalist society and there's companies pivoting fast for different things. 
there's a, a mobile company I know that was really doing auto detailing and oil changes. And immediately now they've pivoted. And in addition to that, they're doing interior sanitization and that certified healthy vehicle that, that Don's talking about. They've already added it in. They've already trained, you know, a couple hundred of their staff uh, throughout the country to get that done. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think it's necessary and, um, you know, we all, we all want to feel safe and, we, and obviously we want to keep our friends and family healthy. Um, so I think it's something that all the dealers are going to be, that's going to be part of what they do from here, here forward. Yeah. And imagine that the, the change in business for rental agencies. I mean, if you have to now, you, know, you can't turn a car in a matter of minutes, right? You're going to have to actually, you know, so maybe you have to increase vehicle size to keep up with within the fleet to keep up with demand because you have to take a car now and st- instead of spending five minutes throwing it through a wash and a sweep, you might have to put an hour or two into sanitizing that vehicle. So I think you're going to see some changes in the fleet space as well. Yeah, I had thought of that, Aaron. Yeah, it's a good point for sure. So, and I know, you know, in terms of the the changing di- dynamics of going online, um, you know, I'll just point out, Don, you know, you and I just got connected here recently because you just became a LinkedIn and Facebook aficionado um, just in the past couple of months and, you know, have done it well, you know, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it can be learned very quickly. Yeah. And, I, and to go back to the question from earlier, I, I've been telling dealers, not, not only I said, sit down really take a deep breath, look at what you're spending and what you're spending it on. Um, And I personally, I think they need to really link up with vendors that they feel comfortable with um, that'll give them good advice and, and literally like figure out the next step. I mean, it, it, it may not be advertising on the radio and on TV or newspaper, like in the past. I mean, maybe a little more focus needs to be on the digital retailing side Texting, um, you know, making making sure that customers have the ability to text in and out um, with with the salespeople, with the finance people. Um, videos are huge. I mean, I think that's that's going to be a lot of the connection. And then, uh, the, of course, the delivery aspect I think is important too. Because and then with Carvana, they have a seven day return policy. I think that needs to be a piece of what they do. Um, as a dealer, it's uncomfortable. To, I mean, I you have customers will come in and say, I can bring this back in three days, right? Well, no, they don't have, most states don't have a three-day policy. You know, that more is tied up with with buying a home. Um, but with, with Carvana, they come in and they shake things up. They do the delivery online. Everything's online and they deliver the car to the household. And then if the customer's not happy with it in seven days, they have a, a return policy. As a dealer, it makes you cringe thinking, oh my gosh, I, I can't bring this thing back. Let them bring it back after a whole week, you know, but, but it's, it seems to be working out for Carvana and customers do like that. And a lot of them won't do that, but at this, you know, the customers won't bring it back in seven days, but the idea that they feel comfort in, okay, they're this confident about this car. They're giving me a week to bring it back. You know, that makes, that makes a buyer more comfortable. I wonder, I've, and I've seen companies do this, Previously, I don't know how prevalent it is, but um, I remember there used to be a, you know, take a three day test drive. Right. Um, And I know some of the fleet companies who have sales outlets um, are doing that. You can, you know, rent the vehicle in a sense for a couple of days. And if you like it, you're financing and everything was already done up front. You just say, I want the car, go in, sign and leave. So I wonder if maybe for brick and mortar companies, if that might not be the better approach of you know, let's get the financing done. Make sure you're qualified. We're not going to put the paperwork in place. We're going to put a dealer plate on it, let you drive it for two, three days, and then let us know if you want to come back and you can take it. Well, I think the one downside or, or concern that a dealer might have in that is um, your exposure is on the insurance side. I mean, that's probably the bigger the bigger fear there. <laughs> True. I mean, we used to we used to do overnight test drives, and. I mean, I, I would, even as the GM, I would say, okay, let them go ahead and take it. And it's almost like you hold your breath a little bit um, until they come back. on. That to me sounds like the opportunity for the insurance companies to have a new product. Absolutely. And yeah, we used to call it, and you probably heard this before, we used to call puppy dog in the car. So they take the new puppy home and they don't want to bring it back. And, or the neighbor sees the new puppy and you're like, oh, you got a new puppy and a new car. And, 
and then it's it's hard to bring a car back after all your neighbors and your friends and your family and they, they see the car so i mean it, it it is a sales tactic that does work um but again, that's you're right. That might be a new product that that insurance companies would have to help out with. Right. Yeah. I think yeah, I, I, that's another idea. I better patent real quick before I start talking too much about. But nice. Um, <laughs> lots of good ideas come up on this uh, this podcast. On. Um, I, I can tell. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm going back to one thing you said earlier too about the you know introduce the on the digital side. So a salesperson, you know, do a quick video, introduce themselves. In all your experience here within within that space, um, have you ever seen and, and is it something that is done where literally FaceTiming with the client and doing a, a live walk around of the vehicle and letting them ask questions and say, can you you know get closer to this? Can you show me that? Is that something that's been used or is that something that has not been used up to this point? You know, I so my my poli- I had a very strict policy with my Internet team. And if you talk to any of the salespeople that have worked with me in the last 20, 22 years, um, and especially when I was a salesperson, I was doing this back when the videos were grainy and I had to use YouTube. And um, but my 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 Internet policy was obviously you get the lead, you read the whole lead, you immediately respond with a personal email. Um, and I say personal, I, I hate templates, but unless you're going to spell everything wrong. I liked it to be a personal email answering their questions, then immediately send a picture of my business card and on a text message and, and, and introduce myself there. Then a personal video, walk around of the car, um, and then a handwritten letter, sn- snail mail, which because that's the personal side. I, and I literally would sell cars to in, in this modern age to customers that would come in a month later and say, I'm here because you actually took the time to write a, a letter to me. Um, so I would still do that. And then obviously a phone call. And to answer your question about FaceTime, it would depend on the salespeople. Um, but yeah, there was there was salespeople that would do FaceTime and it was a live interaction with the car behind them and, and answering the customer's questions. Um, and when I did videos, if I if I went out there, I, I wanted to be I wanted to sell the way I wanted to buy. If I found a ding or down a scratch, rust, I, I showed them in the video and there's still sales managers out there that would say, oh, my gosh, why would you show them that it had rust? Well, why let them drive three hours and then get there and then they leave mad because there was rust on the car? Just show them what's going on with that vehicle. I mean, there, there's there's no there's no shame in that. And if you and believe it or not, you would end up selling more cars by doing that because that customer would say, wow, they actually took the time. They showed me that in a video. They showed me the dents, the dings, the scratches. And, and I might then as a salesperson say, this car, this is the condition, but you know what? We just got this car and it, it, there's no dings or dents or scratches and it hasn't been smoked in. Customers are going to respect that. Will you lose some customers? Yeah. But you know what? I would rather sell that way and be honest and upfront with the customer than bring them in three hours. They get mad. They, 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 they show their, their opinion in the, in the showroom and other customers are like, oh my gosh, is this how they treat people type of thing? Well, and I think, you know, in those cases, you lose the customer just maybe because of inventory, right? You don't lose them because of you lost respect. That's what I was just going to say, Aaron. I think that's a big thing is it's more the inventory. And then when they're either going to make their next vehicle purchase or, you know, another family member's purchase, they're going to be like, hey, you know, go check out, you know, Don's dealership down the road because they, I wasn't able to get a car there, but I know that they're honest and they're upfront. And I think that's, you know, those, those buzzwords of transparency and consumer advocacy, those are buzzwords for a reason. And I think that's a big thing of what's happening in the automotive industry of, of us trying to catch up to the way consumers want to buy vehicles is, you know, they don't, it, they don't want to be haggled. They don't want to, they don't want to have to go through all of those, oh yeah, drive all the way down here. And no, it looks like the car has been smoked in or it has this huge rust spot or, you know, it's like, just be honest with it and open and people are going to be very much more open to then continuing to do business with you, especially with, you know, dealerships have a lot of negative connotation to fight against in, you know, with the general public. And so don't contribute to that. Instead, bring that transparency to your consumers. And and that's how you're going to keep them for life is providing that experience for them. My, my biggest fear right now, as far as being in the mid, in the midst of this pandemic is all the people that have been laid off, um, they're, uh, 
they're not sure about their their future as far as their job. Um, you know, and then the longer it goes, the scarier that gets. Um, I, you know, they they um, they might have enough to to take care of their bills for a month or two. Um, yeah, some stimulus checks might come in, um, but it's it's usually not enough. Um, so I, I really want them to come to a to a quicker end to us getting our freedom back and be able to to, to operate and go back to work. Um, and that's that's probably in my daily prayers too. Absolutely. I think we all agree with that one. I mean, the sooner mm-hmm. we can get back to normal and take the lessons learned right from this and make sure that we're we're a little more prepared as an industry um, for anything else that might put us in this situation. So absolutely. Well, so, absolutely. so Don, I wanted to before we uh, before we run out of time and have to sign off, I, I definitely um, would like to let you get that shameless plug in and tell everybody a little bit more about what you're doing um, at Ship Your Car Now, as well as your independent consulting business. Well, basically what I'm so I, I, I feel like I can bring value to every dealer in the United States. Um, so walking away from a, um, the retail side as a general manager of a, of a store was a little bit scary, um, but, it, but I was ready for that next phase. So the Don Brady Consulting Inc. is basically a umbrella over what I felt like were no-brainer products. So the first one being Ship Your Car Now. So I'm the vice president of dealer success um, for Ship Your Car Now. Now, Ship Your Car Now basically has, they've been shipping cars in, in North America for a decade. Um, so they've got trucking companies all over the United States and, and, and Canada and beyond. But um, now they've got the technology piece that actually a dealer can get the button that they can push and they can get an instant quote. Um, what I used to have to do at, in the store level was we'd get on a call, we'd call 1-800 number, we'd get a quote, and and then we'd get on, we'd hang up, get that quote, we'd call another one, get a quote, and we'd try to get two or three to get the best um, the best deal on that shipping. And it would take a lot of time, sometimes 30, 40 minutes, you'd have to listen to the on-hold music. Well, with Ship Your Car Now, the dealer can literally push a button and it gives them quotes instantly on on that shipping so it's real quick we can also do a customer facing button on every car on their website so now if a customer just like on carvana they can go in there they can find that ford tourist they like they can hit ship ship your car now's button on on that website and get a quote and then just like on amazon they can when they check out they can schedule their shipping they know what it costs they can add it to their car payment it's all it's all seamless for the customer so that's on the ship your car now side. So I'm also looking at digital retailing pieces, um, a texting feature. Um, um, there's an insurance feature with uh, um, dealer policy. So I, I'm, I basically have put together a briefcase of what I call no brainers. And when I sit down in front of a dealer, I'm not gonna go in there and you know open up my coat and say, here, here's different prices and different things that we offer. Dealers like to get the biggest bang for their buck. And a lot of the companies that I'm representing, they charge nothing or they charge very little. So dealers will like hearing that. And the biggest piece that I want to give to my dealers is me, that I'm going to be there for them. Um, even if they have a short, they're shorthanded on salespeople on a Saturday, they can call Don Brady and I'll come in and sell cars for them. I mean, I want to really help dealers out there. <laughs> well, you know, we'll have to make sure you, uh, let everybody know on LinkedIn which dealership you're going to be at and when selling cars so everybody can come give you a hard time. Yeah, I, I would actually enjoy that. So, and, and the cool thing is about being nationwide is that I can go anywhere in the country and I can help dealers. But I, I also offer that they can call me. I mean, the neat thing about being a vendor, in my opinion, with me is that I've, I've been there. I mean, I, I, I served 10 years in the Army and then I spent 22 years in the car business. And I've I've went from salesperson to aftermarket manager to finance manager to to general sales manager to general manager. So I've I've, I've seen it all. I've done it all. Um, I can. So when I when I speak with a dealer, I speak their language. Um, I and I and I do it with the experience behind me. So I, I think I can make a lot of sense, and I can I can really help them. And I've and I've been through the transitions from no internet to internet crazy to 
now, you know, um, you know, this is a whole thing with this pandemic. I, again, I, I've tried to think if I was a general manager right now, what would I be doing? And my, my best answer to that would have been, I'm going to try to do business as usual online. Um, in these states that are not allowing dealers to sell online, I think it's ludicrous, it's ridiculous, and they, they need to make that change happen quick. Well, Don, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate the expertise that you were able to bring here to this discussion. Um, and Aaron, thank you as well for your time. Um, this has been another episode of The Axis. And if you would like to follow along to more of our episodes, you can follow us on YouTube. Um, we will actually be getting up to the podcast channels here shortly. And um, we'll catch you on another episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me.